so this this lecture is intended for a fairly broad audience, so there will be a lot of basic information regarding the Audi test, uh, but we will dive into some details later on, primarily, I guess, in the, the second half of the, the lecture. Um, so I'll give some information about details regarding different kinds of test setups and some considerations to think about when preparing tests. Uh, so I'm going to start a bit about talking about us at the Heritage Board and also talking about the, um, the importance of emissions testing. Then I'll go into what the Audi test is, and I wanted to give a little bit of information about um, the history of the Audi test, just like the basic history um, and some developments over time. Uh, I will describe our process that we use here at the Heritage Board and then talk about some considerations. So for example, uh, the types of vessels that people use, different kinds of coupon preparation techniques, uh, safety issues, that's a very um, important part of it. And then lastly, we will have our question and answer session. So just quickly, we wanted to host this lecture and this workshop as a way to provide easily accessible and educational information about material testing in cultural heritage environments. And we have received a number of questions every year about material testing, about emissions testing, and about audio testing. And so we recognize this as, as an important issue uh, that people are interested in. So uh, we thought that we should provide some educational outreach um, for these kinds of topics. And I would also like to note that um, since the Audi, Audi test is such a popular technique in the preservation community, there is a large amount of open access and easily available information about the test if you want to do your own uh, detailed research. So as I mentioned before, we are the Heritage Laboratory at the Swedish National Heritage Board, and we are a national resource within Sweden for questions related to scientific analysis of cultural heritage. Our laboratory is located uh, in the UNESCO World Heritage City of Visby on the island of Gotland, and we work on a wide range of questions ranging from material identification to technical and x-ray photography of objects to developing standards uh, for cultural heritage and to providing advice about uh, hazardous materials in collections. One of our focus areas in recent years has been on materials used for display, storage and transport of cultural heritage and finding better ways to understand how these materials might affect the preservation of collections. So this was sort of kickstarted by a project that we had with the National Museum in Stockholm starting in 2017. So the museum was undergoing a multi-year renovation and they were in the process of buying all sorts of new materials, new paints, new display cases, uh, new types of display materials, and they wanted to have a better understanding of how these materials might affect their collection. So as part of this project, uh, they wanted to collaborate with us uh, to perform Audi testing of many of these new materials. So we invested some time and some money into setting up an Audi testing protocol in our lab. Uh, and we even invited someone from the British Museum to do a workshop with us about Audi testing. After this project, we opened our Audi testing process as a service to other state financed institutions within Sweden. And um, these institutions can send materials to us. And we usually perform testing just a few times a year. Uh, it really depends on, on how many materials we receive uh, from people. And we have been building a, a database of our tested materials, and we publicly share this database. So to begin uh, concerning the actual perhaps scientific portion of the, uh, of the lecture, the Audi test, it's a basic emissions screening test, and it helps to identify materials that may be potentially harmful for cultural heritage objects by testing for the types of emissions that they produce. 
And as professionals working with the preservation of cultural heritage, we are all concerned with emissions from materials because uh, these emissions can cause various forms of deterioration. So, for example, uh, in this image on the bottom left, we have um, some silver bowls and a silver spoon from uh, the National Museum in Stockholm that once were very uh, shiny and silver looking, but over time they have corroded, uh, forming this sort of black uh, tarnish layer that's made of silver sulfite. And on the right, we have an example from the Post Museum, um, also in Sweden. And this is an example of a lead uh, letter seal that has corroded over time, forming these sorts of white uh, fluffy corrosion products along the edges. So, Understanding emission properties of materials can be important when we are introducing new materials into spaces where we are displaying cultural heritage or we're storing it or we're packaging it for transport. And these types of materials can include things like adhesives, foams, mounting boards, plastics, uh, and much, much more. And as a preventive me measure, we ideally would like to test these materials to make sure that they are not harmful before they're used in the presence of cultural heritage. We can also be concerned with emissions from aged display storage or transport materials. And um, these, these types of materials, they can deteriorate over time, uh, producing new kinds of emissions. And uh, additionally, Emissions from cultural heritage objects themselves can actually harm other objects in collections uh, if they are stored close to each other. So the emissions that we are primarily concerned with uh, in cultural heritage environments are uh, first sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxides. We are also interested in reduced sulfur gases, for example, hydrogen sulfide and carbonyl sulfide. We're also interested in certain organic gases, such as acetic acid, formic acid, acetaldehyde, and form formaldehyde. Uh, I would like to mention that chlorides can also be an issue um, for cultural heritage, but I would say they're not as wide of a problem for indoor environments as um, some of these uh, emissions are. So sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxides are primarily known as outdoor pollutants, but there are some materials that can produce these emissions. So for example, objects that are made of cellulose nitrate can produce nitrogen dioxide, uh, but hopefully these types of materials, uh, since they are quite flammable, um, are safely isolated uh, somewhere in your collection. And also vulcanized rubber has been known to produce sulfur dioxide emissions. Reduced sulfur gases can be produced by um, proteins, so animal-based materials like wool, silk, or felt, animal-based adhesives, and also waterlogged organic uh, objects such as wood. Acetic acid, formic acid, acetaldehyde, and formaldehyde can be produced by a wide range of materials such as wood-based products, paints, adhesives, coatings, plastics, and I would like to mention that these are just some examples, and this is not like a, a fully extensive list. So we're interested in these types of emissions because they can result in things like corrosion of metals, embrittlement of organic materials, colorant fading, uh, darkening or fading of photographs, um, just to name a few uh, types of deterioration phenomena. And the purpose of the audio test is to identify materials that have the potential to, potential to produce these kinds of emissions. So I, I won't go into any more detail about pollutants, um, but if you want to know more about pollutants and um, how to measure them in cultural heritage environments and how they can affect different types of cultural heritage materials, there are several thorough publications, such as by the Getty, the Western Association for Art Conservation, the Canadian Conservation Institute, and our own institution, the Swedish National Heritage Board.
So how does the Audi test identify these types of materials that produce um, emissions that we do not usually want in our cultural heritage environments? So while there are many variations on the test, the basic idea of the Audi test remains essentially the same. So the material that you are interested in testing is placed inside a closed glass vessel along with a small amount of water and uh, polished pieces of metal. Uh, I will, will refer to them as metal coupons uh, throughout the rest of this presentation. And these metal coupons are usually made of lead, silver, and copper. And this vessel is typically placed in an oven at 60 degrees Celsius for four weeks or 28 days. Although um, there have been some variations in temperature and length of time, uh, depending on um, the institution. And then after four weeks, the coupons are removed from the vessel and then they are visually inspected for corrosion. So if there is visible corrosion on one or more of the coupons, then the material has produced an undesirable emission and the material does not pass the Audi test. So this indicates that the material should generally not be used near cultural heritage objects um, or used perhaps with certain limitations near cultural heritage objects. And typically there are three types of assessment grades for these coupons. The coupons can either pass if it has no corrosion on it or simply some oxidation layers. And I'll explain how to identify those oxidation layers later. They can be temporary if the coupon shows a uh, very light corrosion and they can also be designated as a fail. Um, and coupons that fail have moderate or heavy corrosion on them. You might also encounter some other terminology such as permanent uh, for materials that pass or unsuitable for materials that fail. Um, but I personally like to use uh, pass and fail. So that's primarily what I will be using throughout this um, presentation. So I also want to mention that if just one out of the three coupons for an Audi test shows heavy corrosion, then that material is considered unsuitable for use. Uh, the term temporary, um, there is a little bit of debate about it, which we will talk about later. Um, it's essentially used to suggest that the material um, has just created small amounts of um, emissions. And um, that's why Sorry, <laughs> it's created small amounts of emissions and therefore could potentially be used for short periods of time like uh, temporary exhibitions. And we'll, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, debated term later. So the, the audio test works for cultural heritage environments because um, the types of metal coupons that we have chosen for um, the audio test um, indicate to us what types of emissions are present. So lead typically corrodes very easily in the presence of acetic acid and formic acids. It's, it produces this white efflorescence. Um, you can see an example here in the center of a very uh, heavily corroded lead coupon. Uh, formaldehyde and acetaldehyde do have the potential to oxidize and form acetic acid and formic acid respectively. And it's so this, these can then also interact with lead. Um, so because of this, lead can act as an indicator for these types of emissions. And similarly, silver and copper can act as indicators for sulfur-based gases. Silver is very sensitive to very low amounts of reduced sulfur gases like hydrogen sulfide, and it typically forms a black uh, corrosion layer like we saw earlier on in the silver bowl and the silver spoon. And copper can react with um, kind of a, a wide variety of emissions. So it can react with sulfides, um, such as sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxides, uh, chlorides, and other types of acidic emissions. And it's at room temperature and moderate relative humidity, which is what we often experience in museums and other cultural heritage environments. Uh, such types of corrosion may take a very long time to become visible. So because of that, this test is performed at high temperature um, and high humidity. So the high temperature helps to accelerate the corrosion process and to increase the number of uh, volatile molecules that are emitted from your material. 
And the addition of water helps to increase the relative humidity. And this is because some corrosion reactions require elevated humidity to occur. So um, while emissions testing of materials can be performed by a number of different techniques, not just um, the Audi test, uh, the Audi test is actually very valuable for cultural heritage institutions because it's very simple to execute, it's simple to interpret, it's inexpensive, and it doesn't require equipment other than an oven and some personal protective equipment. So because of this, there are a lot of institutions that can perform the Audi test and do perform the Audi test themselves um, when material questions arrive for their um, collections. However, the Audi test does have some issues, of course. So as mentioned previously, this test is based on visual analysis of the metal coupons and therefore it's subjective in nature. Uh, the results could, they could vary depending on who is doing, doing the interpretation, the former experiences of the person doing the interpretation, um, the kinds of um, designations uh, that institutions have set uh, for doing interpretation processes. There's also a very large um, variation in the test and how it's performed. So different institutions use, for example, different vessel sizes, different vessel shapes, um, different vessel closures, different ways of securing the coupons, different amounts of water, as well different different types of sample preparation and coupon preparation techniques. So in some ways, I, I do see this as a benefit to the Audi test because it does make it more flexible and more accessible to a wider audience and a wider number of users, uh, but it also leads to varying and inconsistent results between methods. So, for example, a, a material that has passed the test using one variation in the test setup might not pass the test um, in another variation. So there has been an interest in developing more standard procedure or at least trying to understand what variables have effects on the results. Um, and there are, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but there are some efforts currently to um, recognize these differences and work towards standardization. Um, but it's still uh, very, um, there's a huge variety of different kinds of uh, tests that are performed. The test also takes quite a long time, four weeks, as I mentioned before, um, to receive an answer. And this might not work well with the more fast paced nature of creating exhibitions. And additionally, since the test takes place at elevated temperature and elevated humidity, it's not exactly representative of actual cultural heritage environments, and it may cause um, deterioration or emission release that normally would not happen uh, at room temperature. And finally, the Audi test may not identify all materials that can cause harm to cultural heritage. So even if a material has passed the Audi test, it still may have the potential to affect cultural heritage objects. And in recent years, there have been some examples of this, of materials that have passed the Audi test, um, but when used in practice, um, has have caused certain issues for display environments. So uh, despite all of this, why do we even want to do the Audi test? Uh, well, it's still a very simple method to identify and screen for materials that have the potential to harm cultural heritage objects. And uh, this information is certainly better than no information about a material. So uh, I wanted to give just a, a brief history of the Audi test. Um, so just talk about some of the, the more, um, the larger developments. And um, yeah, discuss like the differences between these kinds of studies over time. So in the 1970s, Andrew Audi at the British Museum developed this test and he published an article in 1973. And this study used polished lead and silver coupons placed in a jar with different types of materials. He used uh, wood, textiles, and adhesives. Um, and he did not place the coupons in contact with these materials. Um, 
And he, he did this because he wanted to investigate um, an issue that they were having at the British Museum. Um, there was an issue with silver coins that had started tarnishing very quickly um, in the collection. So he took this jar and exposed it to 60 degrees for four weeks, and he also used a blank test. So this is where uh, no material was placed in the glass jar, um, but it, also, it still included the, uh, the metal coupons. And this idea of exposing metal coupons to materials for emission identification, it was not a new idea, but this was the first time that it had been applied towards materials used for display of cultural heritage. In 1975, Andrew Audi released a new paper, which he described the addition of a copper coupon and the addition of water uh, placed inside the test tube. Um, since he, he realized that the corrosion of silver by hydrogen sulfide does require humidity to occur. So later in the 70s, Blackshaw and Daniels further refined this test um, to include two grams of material inside the vessel. So using two grams is now a very common practice in most procedures today. They also investigated different methods of cleaning the metal coupons to remove or any uh, contaminants or organic residues, and they found that um, degreasing the, the coupons and acetone was a suitable process. And I should mention that in uh, these three um, earlier procedures, they incorporated carbon dioxide uh, into the tubes to encourage lead corrosion, um, since one of the main um, corrosion products of lead is lead carbonate but it was actually found later on that um, this was not needed. So that's why um, we don't use carbon dioxide in the Audi testing procedure anymore. By the 1990s, several museums had begun using the Audi test with varying types of procedures. And the British Museum decided to conduct an interlaboratory test to compare different kinds of Audi testing methods. So they did a, a first round of testing and allowed each institution to test the same five materials using their own methods that they use in their own institutions. And they found uh, the results between in institutions varied quite greatly. Quite greatly. Uh, following this, several experiments were performed at the British Museum to develop a more standardized method. So for example, this new method proposed using only high purity metal coupons uh, a standard coupon size, which um, at the time was 10 by 15 millimeters. They proposed a method for sealing the vessel that wouldn't cause any water loss, and they used a standard water to air ratio. And that ratio at the time was uh, 1 to 100. They also uh, suggested implementing reference photographs of um, previously tested coupons to try and reduce the subjectivity in interpretation. So the standard method was then used in a second interlaboratory test where they found that the variability in the results um, decreased noticeably in the second round. But unfortunately, perfect agreement was not achieved. Um, and this may have been due to some participants who did not follow this standard procedure. So up until the 1990s, it was common practice to place just one metal coupon inside one testing vessel, either by hanging it by a nylon thread from the top or placing it in the bottom of a glass vessel. But in 1999, the Metropolitan Museum of Art proposed combining all three metal coupons, so silver, copper, and lead, into one single vessel, and they called it the three-in-one Audi test. So to do this, they needed a, a larger, wider glass vessel than was used at the British Museum. And they folded these metal coupons over a small glass beaker. The British Museum also began using this three-in-one variant in the early 2000s, but they proposed to not bend the coupons over a beaker edge, um, as this could potentially result in condensation, which might result in unwanted corrosion on the coupons. So instead, they suggested using a silicone stopper for the lid, um, and you could cut the silicone stopper and insert the three coupons directly into um, the silicone stopper in a vertical fashion. Um, 
and the lead coupon was placed in the center and the silver and copper on the edges to avoid any contact with the, the glass edges um, and again avoid condensation on the coupon. Some further up updates were proposed by the British Museum in 2018, um, but these primarily focused on small details such as uh, different brands for washing liquids for the glass, uh, different types of polishing abrasives for the metals, different types of uh, or different brands of acetone for cleaning the coupons. And they additionally proposed methods for preparing some uh, notoriously difficult materials to test like paints and liquid adhesives. So since the early 2000s, there have been a number of studies working to improve the test using advanced techniques as well. So uh, for example, using uh, deposited thin films that are more reactive than typical coupons. So this could potentially uh, shorten the exposure time and also act for a representative of very sensitive uh, silver objects like daguerreotypes. Others have worked to reduce the subjectivity in interpretation by using things like digital image processing, neural networks, or quantitative electrochemical methods. And some studies have created features um, or custom, sorry, custom features rather than using materials that are already on the market. So some people have created custom blown glass vessels specifically for audi testing or coupon holders um, made from 3D printed nylon or a stainless steel that again are specifically for audi testing. And um, additionally, some re ha researchers have supplemented the audi test um, with other types of emissions testing. So for example, using um, a solid phase micro extraction to extract emissions from materials and then using gas chromatography with mass spectrometry to analyze the emissions. So surveys and reviews of the Audi test have shown that there are at least uh, tens of different variations of the Audi test and one can simply see this by visiting the American Institute for Conservation's wiki page on Audi testing. Um, and reading through some of these procedures that they have list listed. There are a wide variety of choices related to the size and the shape of the glass container, uh, the process for cleaning the glassware, the process for testing or for uh, preparing the test material and preparing the uh, metal coupons. Um, and even um, the different kinds of lids uh, that people use and different ways of suspending the glass or the, the metal coupons over the material. So the, the primary uh, variables that more or less have remained the same, um, or at least very similar to each other across testing methods are the amount of testing material. So that's often two grams. The types of coupons used, typically silver, lead, and copper, but there have been some variations on that and the exposure time and the temperature. But again, there have been some slight variations in that as well. And these were all parameters that were established pretty early on by the British Museum at least 30 years ago, if not earlier. So also, as I, I mentioned previously, one can also see in the AIC Audi testing database. So they have um, a database where people have sent in results um, for Audi tests that they have done, stating uh, which uh, institution it is, which material they've tested, um, which procedure they've used. And um, you can also see that there are some examples of um, uh, materials that um, don't really quite agree with each other in terms of their results. So this is just a really quick example of a material called uh, Sintra. It's a brand of expanded uh, polyvinyl chloride. Um, that is that doesn't have any um, plasticizers in it. Um, and it has received received results of pass, temporary and fail from different museums and from different protocols. In recent years, there has again been an interest in performing the sort of interlaboratory round robin testing across institutions, similar to what was performed um, by the British Museum in the 1990s. 
So one example would be the American Institute for Conservation's Materials Working Group. They initiated tests with both North American and European institutions to determine the repeatability of um, certain Audi testing methods. So they did a first round of testing in 2019 and they used uh, seven, dif seven different materials uh, that were sent to all of the same institutions and they used three different protocols. So they used a protocol by the British Museum, uh, one by the Met, and then one by the Indianap Indianapolis Museum of Art. Also, uh, a multi-institutional Audi testing project was initiated as part of the European Heritage Science Research Consortium um, called Iperion to identify differences between Audi testing methods and how these differences have the potential to affect results. So much like with AIC's round robin interlaboratory te testing, um, they used 10 of the same materials and they were tested by eight different institutions. So the, the results from these large studies have not been uh, published yet, um, but they're again working towards this idea of uh, highlighting aspects of the Audi test um, that make the results so inconsistent and perhaps moving towards a more uh, standard method. At our institution, the Swedish National Heritage Board, we use the three-in-one method that's currently proposed by the British Museum. So this means that we use a long and thin glass boiling tube. It's around 50 milliliters in volume. We use two grams of material and we use a small vial uh, filled with approximately um, 0.5 milliliters of water. And this small vial is plugged with a piece of cotton. And then the, the tube um, is plugged with a silicone stopper. And in the silicone stopper, we cut, um, we cut it with a scalpel and we insert the silver, copper and lead coupons um, into the silicone stopper. When we are when we are preparing uh, materials for testing, we we do try to prepare them in a way that's representative of how the material is used in practice, so how it's used in display or storage, um, with the limitation that it does have to fit uh, inside the the glass tube. So, for example, we cut solid boards into blocks. We cut papers and textiles into strips. Tapes can either be adhered uh, to themselves or to a sheet of um, plastic like Melanex or Mylar. And wet materials like adhesives or paints do require a, a drying time. And so we try to reflect that drying time based on how they're used in museum environments. So uh, paints are made into thin layers on um, plastic. Uh, we use Melanex and we allow them to dry for four weeks before testing while adhesives or sealants are deposited onto melanix again, and they're dried either according to the manufacturer instructions, or uh, if there are no instructions, then they're dried for 48 hours. The, uh, so again, within our, within our practice here in the laboratory, the, the practice of uh, polishing and cleaning the coupons is a very important part of the process. And we do this by polishing both sides of all three coupons with a P600 sandpaper until each surface appears evenly polished. And we do this to remove, remove any native surface oxides on the coupon and to give them a more reactive surface. Uh, lead in particular can develop a blue or a purple surface oxide in storage over time. So we do try to remove that um, in, in order to expose the more reactive surface underneath. And after polishing, we place the coupons in an acetone bath. And when it's time to insert the coupons into the stopper, we remove them from the bath and then we dry them using lint-free wipes. And after assembling everything, we place the tubes vertically in our oven. So we, we reuse our glass boiling tubes. So those are the larger tubes. And we wash them in a dishwasher with uh, an alkaline cleaning liquid. And if we notice that the tubes have any uh, like residues on them or need some extra cleaning, then uh, we can do some more intensive cleaning processes like using uh, an acid bath um, and a base bath to soak them. 
We also do duplicates of every material that we test, and this is to help us determine re reproducibility or to identify something went wrong with one of the tests. So if the two tests of the same material have very different results, um, which is rare, but it does happen, um, then we perform a retest of the material. And we also include two control boiling tubes. So they do not have any material in them, but they do have the water vial and they do have the three metal coupons inside. And this is help. This helps us to determine if there's anything wrong with the, the batch of the um, tests that we are performing. So this was actually very important for us at the very beginning of our audio testing um, because we were actually noticing some black spots and black corrosion on some of our coupons, um, uh, on some of the coupons from the control tubes. So uh, after doing some tests, we realized that this was actually from our oven. So our oven wasn't um, providing very even um, heating. And then there was condensation forming on our coupons, which then led to this black corrosion. So uh, that told us that we needed to buy a new oven for <laughs> audio testing. And just very quickly about how we deal with uh, safety, but I will talk. I will talk more about safety later on. Uh, since we are dealing with organic solvents and with metal dust, we always take uh, precautionary safety measures. So we wear lab coats, we wear nitrile gloves and uh, safety glasses. Um, and I do all of the metal polishing in a fume hood personally, um, especially the lead polishing. And if I can't perform the copper and silver polishing in the fume hood, then um, I, I typically wear some sort of a, a particle mask to avoid inhaling any kind of uh, metal particles. Um, and this is because we often do uh, a lot of polishing at once, so I don't want to breathe in a lot of metal dust. The, the lead polishing procedure is always performed in the fume hood, and we also wear these plastic disposable sleeves. Uh, to reduce any kind of dust accumulation onto our lab coat sleeves. We also keep the acetone baths in the fume hood too, and we cover it with a glass watch dish. And any tools that come in contact with lead, they're kept in their own special closed container to avoid any kind of uh, lead contamination. And additionally, any, um, any disposable materials like gloves or these disposable sleeves or paper towels, um, anything that might have lead dust on them are, is considered lead containing hazardous waste and uh, these have to be disposed of according to local or state regulations. So we combine all of that um, stuff into a bag um, and then we have a uh, hazardous waste company pick it up for us. So when we are performing interpretation of the coupons, we always have at least two people performing interpretation. Uh, so to do this, we have written descriptions of what constitutes a pass, a temporary, or a fail. And um, something that I would like to do in the future is I'll also have uh, pictures detailing examples of pass, temporary, and fail for each type of coupon. There are other institutions that have these kinds of images that they use for their own procedures, and they actually, um, for example, the Met, um, they share these images um, on the AIC uh, wiki for audio testing if you want to see those images. Um, but that's not something that we have um, instituted yet, um, but hopefully in the future. We also have an internal database where we keep track of all the tests that we have performed since 2017, and we include information about the material we tested, which institution sent it and when, who performed the test, and the results. We also share a lot of our results publicly through our online database, through our website. And um, we keep more detailed records of the materials we have tested uh, with um, the material itself. So we have kind of an archive of materials we tested in the past. Um, and each material has this sheet that you can see in the middle. And it, it includes information about how the material has been stored previously and how it will be used by the institution that has sent it to us. So um, I think that we will actually take a break uh, before we go on to considerations. Um, but I just wanted to give you a heads up for what will come in the, the second half of the, the lecture. So um, 
we are going to highlight some different kinds of issues um, and things to think about when doing the audi tests for example uh, the vessel materials that you're using how you're cleaning your glassware if you can re reuse vessel materials how to prepare samples polishing of the metal coupons the amount of water uh, to use where to place the coupons or how to place the coupons interpretation and again uh, health and safety and I just want to say that even though our lab uses the, the British Museum 3-in-1 protocol, we don't advocate for one specific method. And I'm not going to tell you, you, you should do this particular method. Um, these considerations, they're more of a like general information um, and can potentially be applied to many different audio testing procedures. For the last part of the lecture, I just wanted to highlight some of these considerations. Uh, we had already talked a little bit um, through them. And um, I guess I, I can mention for if there's anyone new here, um, we are recording currently and um, we will, will be recording just the lecture. So we won't be recording the question and answer session at the end and we won't be recording the viewing of the laboratory. Um, but we hope that we can actually put this lecture online um, soon after it's um, completed. So the people who miss things um, can come back and learn again. And uh, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat. If you have any discussion points as well, or just um, experiences from doing the audio test, you are welcome to write them in the chat as well. Um, but yeah, we will get going then. So if we start with uh, vessel materials. So first and foremost, you do want to make sure that the vessel you're using um, and the materials that are part of this vessel uh, don't affect the test results. So for example, if you are incorporating a new brand of lid or new brand of stopper or a new type of coupon holder, it's best at the very least to perform an audit test of this new material uh, to make sure that it doesn't produce any kind of corrosion on the coupons. However, uh, with that, there's a caveat, I guess, to that. Uh, other types of um, effects might not be easily visible um, in the test. So, for example, the original three-in-one test developed by the Metropolitan Museum of Art used soda lime glassware as a vessel. And it was later found out that this glassware was in fact affecting the results, but not in a way that people could easily see. So this type of glassware is less stable than some types of um, like stable lab glass, like borosilicate glass, and it has the potential to leak alkali. So particularly at high temperatures and these leached alkali ions can interact with the acidic gases that might be produced by the material during the test and it could then lessen the effect of the materials on the metal coupons. So this could uh, potentially lead to less corrosion on the coupons and could lead to an interpreter identifying material as temporary when it really should have failed the test as an example. So the recommendation for all Audi testing now is to use highly stable borosilicate glass. Additionally, uh, regarding the purity of metals used for coupons, it was suggested several decades ago by the British Museum that high purity metal should be used, at least 99.5% purity. And this is because impurities can influence the corrosion behavior of metals, uh, which can, of course, then affect the results. All protocols, uh, or at least the ones that I have read, reuse the large glass vessels for the Audi test. And some even reuse the, the small glass vials that are used to store water. And this seems to be an appropriate strategy as long as the glassware is properly cleaned. So you essentially want to make sure that the molecules from your previous test uh, is removed from the glass walls before testing a new material so it doesn't affect uh, any future tests. So as I mentioned before, we do this in our lab by using an alkaline solution. Uh, it's called Extran AP17, for those of you who want to know. 
and we use uh, it's it's connected to a standard laboratory dishwasher. So this is our dishwasher and uh, how we uh, clean our tubes. And as I said before, we might also do some intensive glass cleaning as well, like soaking in an acid bath or an alkaline bath um, if they need uh, some extra um, intensive cleaning. But uh, I should mention that there are as many protocols for glassware cleaning as there are for the Audi test. And uh, a lot of these glassware cleaning processes are actually um, uh, discussed in detail on the AIC wiki page about Audi testing. So if you want to look through some different glass cleaning procedures, um, there's some very detailed ones there. If you don't have a laboratory dishwasher, that is perfectly OK, uh, because you can also perform uh, proper washing by hand. It's just that the dishwasher takes uh, less, less time and less effort. Um, you can also soak the glassware in acidic or alkaline solutions. And you really just want to make sure that you are wearing the proper uh, personal protective equipment, such as lab coats or protective glasses and gloves. And there are some procedures that also use organic solvents as well, like acetone and isopropanol to clean their glasses. Um, and again, much like with choosing appropriate materials for your Audi testing vessel, you want to make sure that the glassware cleaning process does not affect your results. So besides the larger glass vessels, there are some institutions that occasionally occasionally reuse other materials like lids or O-rings that might be in the lids or coupon holders. And this is certainly possible, but it, it does need to be done with caution. So for example, the Met, um, they use a polypropylene screw lid for their vials. Um, and they, they do... Uh, they, so they, they don't reuse these screw lids for materials that have failed the test, um, but they can reuse them for materials that have a result of temporary. So they say that they use them four times um, if the lid has been through a test that resulted in a temporary material. And they also reuse lids from materials that uh, passed the test. Similarly, similarly um, in the procedure by the Indianapolis Museum of Art, they use silicone stoppers, much like we do. And they say that these can be reused in their procedure uh, for materials that test tested as temporary and materials that tested as pass. Uh, but they discard any stoppers from materials that received a um, failing result. Also, they, they say that they, they discard any stoppers that have any evidence of uh, breakdown, so discoloration or um, like uh, deposits or um, I guess shaving, not shaving of the surface, but um, flaking of the surface. The material preparation can also have an effect on your test results. So for example, a material that has been pre pre prepared by cutting or shaving into very small pieces will have more exposed surface area compared to a material that is tested in the form of, for example, just a one centimeter square cube. So having more exposed surface area can lead to a higher amount of volatiles emitted from the material, and that could then lead to more corrosion on the metal coupon um, and a result that might result in uh, failing instead of temporary or, or pass. Um, so I would say that most procedures prefer to try and replicate as best as possible how the material will be used in practice. So for example, this means that uh, solid bulky materials are only cut into blocks that are small enough to fit into the tube. Uh, this also means that um, composite materials have to include all the parts and all the layers in a ratio that represents how they would actually be used in practice. Liquid materials like paints and coatings and adhesives they they can pose some issues because they require drying times. So these different types of materials, they contain water or solvents or other types of additives that release into the air while they are drying. And depending on how the material will be used in practice, you may or may not want to test those kinds of volatiles. 
So some audio testing procedures call for testing freshly cast films, while others allow liquid materials to dry for days or for weeks before audio testing. And in either case, uh, these types of liquid materials always have to be placed on some sort of substrate um, that won't affect the test. So for example, uh, plastic like Melanex or Mylar that won't affect the test. So as I said before, we use uh, Melanex and this helps to make sure that the liquid um, doesn't stick to the glass vessel. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, when we are testing these kinds of materials, uh, we either abide in, in our lab um, by the curing procedures given by the manufacturers um, or dry the materials according to how museums would dry the materials before they use them um, in a display case um, or in a stored space. So in the past, we have dried paints for four weeks before testing, but uh, even then it's still possible by that time that maybe some small molecules that have not released into the air yet um, have, yeah, they're just like still stuck in the material. I guess it depends on the type of the paint and uh, the thickening of the codis, the thickening, the thickness of the coating. <laughs> um, and this could essentially affect the consistency of the results that you get for these kinds of materials. So uh, despite the type of material, all protocols stress that it's important to test new materials and not materials that have been sitting in a storage for years, unless you have a very specific intent to test an old material. And this is because porous materials, they can absorb uh, volatiles and different kinds of pollutants from their surroundings over time, uh, which might then be re-released during the Audi test and potentially affecting the results. Several institutions such as the Met and the British Museum, they have very detailed descriptions of their material preparation procedures online. So this is an example, again, on the AIC uh, wiki for Audi testing. Um, this is the, the METS, a part of the METS um, procedure for material testing that you can download and access, um, describing different types of materials, liquids, um, solid materials, composites, uh, tapes. And I would also like to mention that with modern materials, manufacturers may change formulations or processes over time. And because of this, it's usually recommended to retest materials every few years. Polishing procedures are yet another process that varies quite widely between institutions. So some institutions polish all three metal coupons, some polish only the lead coupon, some polish only the silver and the copper coupons, and different institutions also use different polishing methods, so, um, or different polishing materials, I guess uh, one could say. So some use silicon carbide, carbide sandpaper uh, or micro mesh paper uh, with different types of grits. Some use glass bristle brushes, and because of this variety, it, it does appear a bit unclear how much an, an effect polishing procedures have on the results of the test, but it could also depend, for example, on the supplier of the metal coupon, um, but maybe that's something that can be made a little bit clearer um, through testing or through these interlaboratory um, tests that are going on. So at our lab, we polish all three coupons and we use silicon carbide paper to remove any surface oxides and other possible contaminants before testing. I did want to mention that the, the British Museum did investigate polishing procedures to some degree. So in 2018, they compared silicon carbide papers, micro mesh papers, wire wool and glass bristle brushes. And um, in general, they, they recommended to not use glass bristle brushes because of health concerns from inhaling uh, glass dust. Um, and they also noticed that the glass bristle brushes um, didn't really remove uh, surface contaminants as well as other methods. But they did note that the three other techniques, so the silicon carbide, sandpaper, the micro mesh, and the wire wool, um, they didn't have any noticeable effects uh, on the test results, so they didn't see any huge differences. 
So again, a safety concern. So no matter um, which polishing, polishing procedure you use, please be aware that it will create dust and you do need to protect yourself against um, inhaling uh, dust particles. The amount of water added to the vessel also, like everything else, differs between institutions and procedures. The addition of water is, is a little bit tricky um, because some materials are more hygroscopic, so they absorb more water um, than other materials. And there are some procedures that uh, try to adjust for this, so they don't have like a, a set um, water amount, rather they adjust it for um, using using more water for materials that are um, more hygroscopic and absorb more water and then using less for materials that are um, that don't ad absorb as much water. And the the ratio of water to air in the vessel is important because what we want during the audio test is we want the humidity to be high enough so that corrosion reactions will um, occur. Um, because there are, as I mentioned before, some corrosion reactions that do require um, higher amounts of water. But we don't want to incorporate too much water because then this could lead to condensation in the vessel, um, condensation on the coupons, which could then potentially lead to unwanted corrosion of the coupons. Some institutions like the MET, they also perform uh, tests for water leakage during the test period. So uh, water leakage is possible if the seal of the glass vessel is not tight enough or the seal of the lid is not tight enough. And it does have the ability to affect the results. So they do these tests by weighing the vials before um, placing them in the oven and then weighing them again after they've been removed from the oven. And they say in their procedure that if more than 25% of the mass is lost, um, then this test is considered a failure and they repeat it. So uh, with all other aspects, like with all other aspects of the test, uh, coupon placement is uh, a, a debated issue um, and varies between procedures. So some institutions um, hang the coupons uh, from uh, the glass vessel. Some institutions uh, place the coupon on the bottom of the glass vessel. Um, but no matter which method you choose, it's important that the coupons, they don't touch each other, and it's important that they don't touch the test material unless you are specifically performing a test where you want the coupon to come in contact with the material. And it's also important that they don't touch the, the glass vials. And this is because of uh, condensation, again. So some examples of uh, different methods of placing the coupons include uh, bending them over a holder, um, so like a stainless steel or a nylon holder. Uh, some people place the coupons directly into the slits in silicone stoppers like we do. Some people hang them from uh, glass, metal or nylon hooks. And um, People do state that bending the coupons and placing them directly into the silicone stoppers, it does have the potential to lead to condensation on the coupons um, in the areas where uh, they have been bent and in, in, in the areas um, where they uh, are placed into the silicone stopper. But uh, typically these effects are ignored during the interpretation process. So during the first interlaboratory test performed by the British Museum in the 1990s. It was established that having a reference, a collection of reference images and detailed descriptions of what is a pass, what is a temporary and a fail, um, was very important for reducing this subjective nature of the Audi test. And currently, a number of institutions do have sets of reference images. And they do share these reference images uh, publicly, typically, again, through the AIC wiki page on Audi testing. And I did want to note that um, some changes in the coupons that you see during the Audi test are not necessarily considered corrosion in the eyes of the Audi test. So, for example, some coupons, um, copper coupons, for example, may turn slightly red. 
during the test, and this is uh, the formation of an oxidation layer. And this would still be considered a pass in the eyes of the Audi test. Um, again, uh, the the lead coupon, it um, also might develop a, a bluish tint or a purple tint, and that could be oxidation as well. And as I mentioned before, early on in the lecture, um, there are these three primary categories of pass, temporarily, tem temporary, and fail. And there has been some debate about the use of temporary. So some institutions suggest that materials that test as temporary can be used in exhibition for six months. Uh, others say they can be used for three months. Um, some institutions have completely removed temporary and just described materials as pass or fail. Um, some have created even more um, categories for describing the corrosion. And I mean, I, I think that a lot of this really depends on the, the policies of the institution, their policies around exhibition, um, and also perhaps how sensitive a particular type of collect collection object may be. So one example would be um, if you are testing materials that are going to go in a display case with uh, silver objects, and you find that this material had a temporary result on silver, um, even though it has a temporary re temporary result, you might not want to use it at all, um, just because you know that this material will be used around silver objects. The health and safety is uh, a very important aspect of the Audi test. So like I said before, lab coats, uh, gloves, safety goggles should be worn, especially when you are working with solvents and especially when you are working with metal dust. And particular care should be taken when dealing with lead dust. So um, you should take efforts to both contain the lead dust so it doesn't like spread easily in an open space. And you should also make efforts to avoid ingesting or inhaling the lead dust. And like I said before, we do this by doing all of our lead polishing inside a fume cupboard and using these disposable plastic sleeves. Uh, if you don't have a fume cupboard, a fume, <laughs> a fume cupboard, <laughs> um, there are other alternatives that you can use. So, for example, uh, the Met has created a special plastic box specifically for lead polishing and it includes an ultra low particulate air filter. And they actually have a link um, to a YouTube video that, that shows this box and it's not super uh, advanced. It does seem like something that people could um, make at home. So this, this link again is in um, the description of their procedure that's available on the AIC Wiki audio testing page. Uh, you can also use um, other techniques for avoiding uh, lead inhalation. So I can only speak for Swedish regulations, but in Sweden, you can work with lead dust using a respirator mask with a replaceable filter of class P3. Um, but you also need to uh, take care to not get lead dust on your skin or in your on your face or in your eyes as well. The dust from copper, silver, and glass fibers can also be irritants. Uh, and I would recommend wearing some sort of particulate uh, filter, uh, like, uh, like a disposable filter mask um, when polishing these as well, especially if you will be polishing a lot of coupons. And organic solvents uh, like acetone and isopropanol, they, they can also be used in a fume cupboard uh, if possible. Alternatively, you can use them in a well-ventilated space or place some sort of lid over um, the acetone or isopropanol, like a, a glass petri dish or a, a watch dish. Uh, and then finally, um, it's good to follow any safety procedures required for any glass cleaning solutions that you may use. So uh, consult the safety data sheet um, for any glass clean cleaning solutions and follow those uh, safety procedures that they recommend. The Audi test, it is, it's not the only way uh, to test for emissions or to screen for um, emissions from materials used in uh, cultural heritage environments. 
So some materials can be very quickly tested for uh, chlorides or aldehydes or sulfur compounds using spot tests. But in this case, you aren't actually testing for emissions. You're testing the material itself. Um, so this, these kinds of spot tests, they don't really give an indication about a material's ability to uh, off-gas harmful emissions. Uh, some institutions perform headspace uh, measurements of materials along alongside the ODI test. So um, typically you will place the material in a small glass vessel and extract the air in this vessel and then use um, usually gas chromatography uh, paired with mass spectrometry to analyze what compounds have been emitted. So um, this can be used like in par parallel with the Audi test if people want to do both Audi testing and this headspace GCMS uh, measurements. Um, one could also use um, other types of uh, emission chambers, pairing them with different types of chromatographic analysis techniques or use uh, micro chambers like in uh, this is something that's called the BEMA scheme. So the BEMA scheme is an emissions testing process that is developed by the German Federal Institute for Materials Research and Testing. Um, and it is geared specifically towards cultural heritage environments. And all of these techniques, the headspace, the emissions chambers, the BEMA scheme, um, they are quite advanced. They are definitely more expensive than the Audi test. And they can tell you which compounds are off-gassing from a material and uh, they could also potential te potentially tell you the concentrations if they do quantification. Um, but even with this kind of knowledge, it can still be challenging to predict how these materials may actually interact with cultural heritage materials or cultural heritage objects. Uh, some researchers have actually developed uh, methods that could replace the visual assessment part of the Audi test. Um, so some people developed uh, using an audio depletion measurement instead of uh, instead of using visual assessment or using um, electrochemical reduction of the metal coupons to determine the corrosion thickness and the corrosion rate of the coupons. Um, but again, this this requires further equipment and further expertise um, that not all institutions um, may have. So just to to wrap up, um, despite the use of more advanced analytical techniques, the Audi test still has a really important role to play in materials testing for cultural heritage environments, and it will likely be continued to be used in the foreseeable future uh, because of its simplicity and its accessibility and its ability to act as an indicator. Um, I do think that it will remain a fairly useful screening process for both large and small institutions. And obviously there is some, the, some research um, that does need to be done to make the test more trustworthy and consistent, uh, and hopefully with um, more recent focus on interlaboratory testing, such issues will be investigated more deeply. So if you are here because you are considering implementing the Audi testing at your institution, but you're not sure where to begin, I would strongly recommend looking through the AIC wiki page on Audi testing. I've mentioned it many times uh, during this presentation. Um, it has uh, a wealth of information there about different types of protocols that people use and also has a long list of literature to look further into. And a lot of this literature is uh, open access um, or easily obtainable, um, so you don't have to worry about having a subscription, um, typically, um, to uh, some of these journals. Additionally, I would also recommend, um, unless you are planning to do like some research yourself, uh, I would recommend that rather than making your own procedure or just haphazardly um, choosing parameters, um, I would recommend choosing one of the existing procedures um, that does already have a lot of research uh, behind it um, and research that has been published. So choosing one of these published procedures, it does make it a bit easier to have results that can be compared to other institutions um, using the same procedure if, if the need arises for that. 